hear me? And would you hear me? No. No? Serious. And now? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So this is sort of going to be a different kind of talk. So uh, let me explain where we come from. Um, basically, we're two grumpy old men. So two grumpy old men are standing between you and lunch. And we, of course, we express ourselves using the grumpy markup language. Um, you hear me now, do you? Yeah. So I know precisely when I have become, or when I realized that I had become a grumpy old man. It was March 2019. I was starting a project, and I was given a computer, not a brand new, but one with a new install fresh from an image. So there was no such history at all. And this is real, I didn't fake this for the conference. This is what I type, like XML schema optional, access date and type, and this is the result I got. <laughs> I had not realized up to this point, but the computer knew this new guy using me is grumpy and old and he needs a dating site for 50 year olds. <laughs> anyway, I always knew. I've been a grumpy old man since I was 15. But <laughs> never mind that. Uh, after last year's Balisage, me and Kert went touristing in New York, you know, doing touristy things. And we happened across this cafe and sat down. This was in the morning and we were drinking coffee. And like grumpy old men do, instead of, you know, talking about the Statue of Liberty, whatever, uh, we told each other war stories. You know, things were really better before. Uh, those youngsters who want to take away our DTDs, damn them to hell. Um, and we realized this is, this is actually a paper. <laughs> and we started thinking about that over beers and stuff, and this is really what resulted. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, um, one of the stories, let, let me kick off with this one, is um, I got involved, there was this uh, company, uh, I think, um, oh, it's, it's that one. Um, the, there was this company and they hired me to do an audit of their um, transformation product or um, um, tool they had built over the years. And they had come to the conclusion that, or, or they saw that whenever they wanted something to change or whenever they found a bug, they needed too much time to actually fix it. Um, and the end result was that they were raising more bugs. So I got invited to look what they were doing. And I saw, oh yeah, there's, the, there's building memory trees here, there's doing stuff there. Um, why aren't they just using XSLT? Because this is a very clear use case for XSLT. So um, I came to this conclusion, I, uh, I, I did a workshop, everyone was very enthusiastic. And before we started uh, talking about contracts and starting to talk about um, migration and all this stuff, we had a coffee. The developers that were in the room were in a separate corner of the coffee, uh, um, around the coffee machine, and I was overhearing them in a, language, in a language they thought I didn't understand. And there was some agitated discussion going on, and one of the developers said, he's going to propose XSLT over my dead body. <laughs> okay, so we went back to the meeting room, and we had this, and we had this uh, contract discussion, and I told the manager, this developers just said, like, this is becoming very religious. They just said, over my dead body. And the manager said, yeah, don't worry, um, make a quote and we'll deal with the contract. We will handle the developers. I get on the plane, I got off the plane, set my mobile phone back up, and there was the text message saying like, thank you for your work, send an invoice, and we will not manage the developers. This is you. <laughs> oh, we... we <laughs> We have, we have rehearsed this. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. anyhow. So, um, uh, there was this uh, company doing automotive. And, uh, well, manuals for car manuals. That means like 15 to 20 types of this uh, car brand. Um, 
easily uh, um, 20 to 25 languages. Yeah, you have to, you have to use data, you know. Um, and HTML and PDF, and that's per year. That means they were on constant pressure of, uh, of, of delivering, like almost a couple of manuals every two, three weeks. And, well, there, were, there was various input from, uh, from this automotive, this automotive, uh, well, the one selling the cars, saying like, oh, we want this changed, and we want this changed. And it never occurred to them that they could actually change the stuff in the data content. So they gave all the change requests from the car manufacturer to their XSLT developer. And at some point, this guy just gave up. And um, so they hired me to, to fix this. And I looked at the code. And for those having done DITA before, um, th there were seriously more XSL if, XSL if statements in this uh, DITA customization than there were actual templates in the, uh, in the OT. So, so this was going in the disaster delays. Um, I got in a fight with the information architect because he didn't believe that we should change the content um, to, um, to go for the changes. And it finally, um, the project just, uh, just broke. The car manufacturer said, you don't deliver on time, so you should go. And they found a different solution. Well, OK, good. That ended my contract with this uh, particular publisher until at some point, like two, three months later, they gave me a call. And he said, hey, here, can you come back? because we have this new project. We are going to do legal publishing, and we're going to do this in DITA. Maybe we can use your help, and maybe we can reuse the stuff you did in the uh, automotive. And I sort of said like, oh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to pause on this. I don't have any time. Well, see, this is how you could have, actually, you could solve this in Agile. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, uh, I did this once. This is, this is a real story in the sense that my first encounter with Agile was a team of 45 people. And they uh, had a one hour and a half stand up every morning because all of the 45 wanted to do their, uh, um, I did this yesterday, I will do this today. And, but I was only half time in the, in, in the project, but still they wanted me to sit in this uh, stand up every day. Um, that worked well until I decided to solve, a, well, they would not dismiss me from the stand-ups, so I decided to put it in the timesheets. I had like seven hours and a half each week in the timesheet just saying stand-up, and then like 60% of the time doing actual work. That's the day they dismissed me from the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the stand-up. Uh, well, this project got cancelled two months later uh, because of budgetary reasons. <laughs> Which sort of reminds me about methodologies. Uh, quite a long time ago, I was asked to do an XSD, an XML schema for some messaging format or the other on site for a big customer. It was to be for six weeks. And they had all the specs, everything was ready. All I had to do was follow the specs and basically write the schema. So six weeks was a lot. I didn't have many meetings. I was on site, hacking away, writing my schema, and six weeks went by, and I delivered my schema. And the very last day, on the Friday, I went to lunch with the project manager, and he sort of looks at me and says, look, uh, we're not going to use your XSD. Of course, the, you know, the guys came up with something a lot better. How oh, cool. I said, and I left the project because that was my last day. But I started thinking about this. Why would they hire me for six weeks when clearly they had no interest in using it? But this was a waterfall project. It was a waterfall methodology. They did everything up front. So they had implementation proposals, they had function descriptions, you know, the lot. And obviously somewhere, there was a requirement for an XSD describing this messaging service. That's waterfall for you guys. Ah, that by yourself. Um, more recently, uh, I did a, an authoring DTD, a new authoring DTD. This was to be a new DTD. And yes, it was a D2D. Um, 
to describe thousands and thousands of legacy documents converted to, into this new format. M more documents being written, uh, yet more documents being merged from other sources converted into this document. So there will be tens of thousands of documents using this new format. And because, well, a lot of it was legacy, it was a fairly loose day today. You know, it, it did allow for a lot of stuff, and my idea was always to add a schematron to it, you know, to make people realize that, no, you're not supposed to use this, even this, if this is allowed. But anyway, there was this department in, you know, at this publisher, and they delivered some of the actual content, Swedish content, to this DTD. And they said, look, we need a strict DTD. We need to make things required. We need to, you know, just force them to do the right thing because the authors really need the guidance. And there was this whole discussion about schematrons and DTDs, and it, never, it, it didn't go anywhere. They wanted DTD, a strict DTD. We had to have a loose one because it would break thousands of documents if it wasn't. And this is when the um, department came back and said, oh yeah, uh, you know, there's strict DTD you have to do. It needs to be in Swedish. So Swedish tag names. And I said, look, uh, most of our developers are not Swedes. Some of them may understand the language, but we always speak English all over the company, right? So they won't understand. Yeah, 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 but, but our authors actually need the tags to be in Swedish so they can do the right thing. It needs to be strict and it needs to be in Swedish. <coughs> and this was another fight, you know, it just wouldn't go anywhere, office politics and all that. And so I started inserting Klingon attribute names <coughs> in the DTD. You know, just th there's actually a Klingon translation service on the web, which is really cool. <laughs> you should try it totally. And I started inserting Klingon attribute names, and what do you think happened? Nobody ever noticed. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened to this thing was eventually because, you know, we didn't want to break thousands of documents and they didn't budge, so my team leader came up with this solution that, yeah, every single time we check out the document from the database using the looser DTD, we convert it to the Swedish strict DCD format for authoring. And when they are done and want to check in, they convert it back to the loose format. Which is just mad because, you know, they weren't fully compatible for obvious reasons, but there we are. And I left the project. And uh, yeah, you may wonder what that means. It means may you endure the pain. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that was, uh, th this is 20 years ago, and so you need that context to actually believe this story. Um, I was invited by a publishing house. Um, they, it, it was a company, 10 people, so that means they had 10 computers. And 20 years ago, that means XSLT using uh, Sablotron or something, maybe some of you remember. Um, and I guess Pearl, and they were doing quite well, uh, except for one publication which was apparently way over their head. Um, it, it was complex, it had huge tables, there was a, a lot of complex things going on, indexes they could not handle. And w with the thing they had built to do it, they basically had to use all 10 computers and bind it together, sharing stuff over the network, get the thing running, and then it would take three days to actually get the publication out. Which means you're blocking all the company's computers to get this running, and um, you can only do it in a long weekend. So when there was a long weekend, there's one developer who left when all the others had gone, and he started the process. They had to do this once a year. And, um, and then come back on a Tuesday, hoping that nothing went wrong, because if so, they had to wait for the next long weekend in order to actually deliver the publication. So, so every year this, uh, this publication usually was one or two months late. Um, so I got in, I checked it, I saw that building a lot of the memory models essentially was the mistake. 
and I suggested an approach, showed them some codes. Um, we all agreed that they should migrate for this one particular project to a certain technology. There was a little tiny thing they didn't realize. Um, the technology was uh, doing streaming stuff and it was going to, and I could prove that they could actually do this on one computer in two to three hours. Um, I left, I meant the quote, uh, I came back later with the quote and they said, yeah, yeah, we will accept this. Migration, training, all's well, we have already agreed to the technology. Hey, what is this little line at the bottom? I said, yeah, well, you need a license for, uh, in, in order to use this, uh, this software. Or they said, no, 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 this company has a open source software only policy, so we cannot use that uh, while we're fixing a problem. No, 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 we cannot use that, so stop. They continued, I think, two or three more years doing exactly this, waiting for a long week, it pushed the button and hope it all went wrong, all went well. Well, um I, a long time ago, I was um, doing a project for a car manufacturer. Uh, I was supposed to go in, do information analysis and systems requirements, and because what they wanted to do, they wanted to port all of their aftermarket documentation, so driver's manuals, accessory catalogs, warranty information, you know, all, all kinds of stuff, in 40 plus languages to XML, they were doing it in page making and Word and stuff. And cool, I said, and I dug in and realized very soon that, yep, XML will do wonders because we can reuse, we can do some light profiling to account for, you know, different engine models and actually do a driver's manual meant for the car you are driving instead of a generic one using 10 engine models, that sort of thing. I had extended X-Link in there because, oh, well, this was 20 years ago, and uh, I really loved that te technique. I, I just wanted to have extended X-Link, basically. <laughs> and all kinds of stuff, and I thought, yeah, this is going to work out great. Now, this is when they came back to me and say, uh, oh, yeah, you know, about the project you're doing, uh, we want, obviously you can use any software you like, but we really want you to use this editor. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, and we also want you, you to use this database and this product. Right, uh, they hadn't read any of my you know, uh, reports or anything like that. This just came back to me. And you also you have to do this we're using this publication engine, this formatting engine, we think it's great. But obviously you can use any standard you want. And by the way, uh, we want you to also uh, include all of our SGML service information and convert that to XML and use it in that system as well. Never read my report. And very quickly I realized that the editor would simply not do anything but ID, ID ref links, which meant that all everything C database and linking was a no-go, just couldn't be done. Uh, we had to do hacks with processing attributes, you know, with huge strings to tell the system what to do in any given moment. This is how we found out that that particular editor had a, an attribute value limit, maximum limit of 8,000 characters. Didn't know that. And uh, everything else went the same way. The first time we ever logged into this system, it took 30 minutes. No kidding. And the architect said, oh, this could have been a really fast system without that database that they forced upon us. And so we went 10 or 15 times over budget, at least. And there were issues, there were probably still issues. I left the project, but I hear that it's actually still running, that system, 10, 15, 20 years later. Uh, about the system, so remember those accessory catalogs and driver's manuals they wanted in XML because they went to you know, 40 plus languages. The Technical authors were opinionated bunch and they did not like the output from the formatting engine because you know you could do the tiny little tweak you needed, that's what they could do in PageMaker. So they basically said, Yeah, we're going to use PageMaker 
instead. We don't, we're not going to use your system. That added, and I'm not kidding, 70% cost to each and every publication, every single time. But here's the thing, though. Sometimes HTML is what you need and what you want. Another fond memory of mine, uh, this is also about 20 years ago, for an aerospace industry, a, a, a manufacturer, they had an HO system running S1000D HTML documents. That system was basically dying, it was rubbish, and it needed to be replaced. So in I went, uh, did an information analysis, and looked at you know, all their requirements. And I very quickly realized that HTML was just fine. You know, because at the time, the entire aerospace industry used HTML. This was S1000D. They didn't want to leave that. They, they would have to go back to HTML anyway to you know, give to their partners and use for their tools. Basically, the problem was that the system was old and needed replacing. And the client, as I said, they were happy with HTML. However, I was working for a consultancy at the time, and they basically were merging with another consultancy, and they saw great business advantages with moving to XML for this particular project. They saw that they could build up this new, exciting, fancy system that they could then resell to other clients. And so they basically forced XML on me, on the customer, on the system. And this thing was built, and it never worked, and it was awful, and they had to go back to HTML for everything anyway. And it ended up with the client suing the consultancy, a really, really expensive lawsuit. It was in the papers. And they bought a competitor's system. So sometimes what you need is HTML. Yeah, we did. Uh, um, uh, we did. We did not just want to tell war stories. Uh, um, you, you all have them, and, and you all have a lot of them, and, and maybe better ones than the one we told you. Um, there is a few. Uh, well, uh, Ari and I share about like uh, together some 50 years of uh, XML consulting or HTML consulting, obviously, and. Uh, so, so there are some giveaways, things we discovered along the road, uh, things we, uh, we, we did find uh, among the ashes. Um, and there's also one thing Ari said that's not completely true, because yesterday I saw that um, after Mark of UK 2019, I sent uh, Jirka a text message saying, when will you open a uh, call for papers for XML Prague 2020? Um, because we have an idea about being pragmatic, and that was because we had been talking in the bar after Markup UK about two excellent papers of presentations we had that year. Uh, one um, where Debbie LaPere was uh, discussing the dragons um, um, we might meet in this kind of industry. And a bit later, Liam Quinn, I'm not sure he's here, um, Liam Quinn saying that, uh, well, some, among other things, of course, he said, well, um, some, some customers are simply stupid. And we said, yeah, well, that's, that's true. Um, there's a lot of stupid things going on. And should we just say, like, uh, the hell with it? We don't want to cooperate in this thing. But, uh, well, we also have to make money. Um, and sometimes you, uh, you, you be pragmatic. You say, I don't like what is going on here. But, well, reasonably, we can make something out of this. Um, there's... Some, some of the giveaways uh, or, or some of the conclusions we drew is, is, about, is about engagement. The first thing is when you get into a project, there is this like uh, obvious rules written like you have to talk to this person and you have to talk to this person. Uh, yes, that is true, but you have to go beyond your action radius. And the best place to do so is the coffee machine. So the first thing you need to learn when you get at a, a new customer is where's the coffee machine? And how can I sort of organize to talk to people who are not involved in the project because they know a lot of things about what goes wrong in a particular project, and they can tell you. There's, a, there's an obvious one um, about engaging. Choose your battles wisely. 
Um, uh, if, if you want to sell XSLT to some convinced Perl programmers, they will say, where is the XSLT C pen? Uh, there's always all sorts of religious discussions you might get involved in. Don't bother because you can't win them. But if there's one potentially religious discussion you should always go in, it's the, um, it's the licensing stuff. Uh, a lot of companies obviously want to use open source, or they mean like we want to do, at least we don't want to spend money on the, uh, on the licensing cost. But it's the licensing that drives, I'm not selling anything, but it's the licensing that drives this ecosystem and, and that drives the maintenance. And uh, th I've been in so many projects where you just have to sort of, you have to use this open source or free version of this particular software, um, which costs you like, uh, the price of the license is like one or two hours of your work, and then you spend two weeks trying to work around all the limitations of the free version. And that's, that's a battle you really have to go into and, and make sure that changes. Um, and then, um, so, yeah. um, a brief thing about contract negotiations. It's something I discovered as well. You go in there and you say, this is, the f this is my perceived value of what I'm bringing. So you name a price and then they start bargaining on the price. That's, that's exactly the moment you just have to get out because you bring value, and if they don't perceive the correct value, they're sort of like, uh, oh, I want to go there and, and we offer this, then you go out. Because you meet in the middle, and meeting in the middle means two parties being frustrated at the end. And some projects just fail. Yeah, you can do that, thanks. Some projects just fail. That's, uh, if, if it fails, walk out gracefully. Yeah, it, it happens. So um, don't, we're professionals, don't start blaming, yeah, it's your fault, it's your fault. Okay. So admit you were wrong. Uh, I guess we're there, no? I, I believe we are. We also have a grumpy cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> so we random, we random, we take questions in a minute, but we randomly spread some brown envelopes today, just randomly. Yeah, randomly. If, you, if you have one. Uh, it, it contains such a t-shirt. If you feel like you want to express yourself in a grumpy markup language, feel free to wear it. Uh, if you support the course. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, and we do have stickers. Uh, yeah. There is so few t-shirts. Well, it costs a fortune. <laughs> yes, yeah, thanks. Any question? Any comments? Do you know where the lunch is? Yeah. yeah. OK. So thank you very much for this thank presentation. You. Very, very. Thank you.